let's start at the beginning then. This was your daughter's 30th birthday party. Yes. What do you remember about the plans for that day? Uh, what do we remember? We remember the girls for, they always celebrated everything together. The girls were all in each other's weddings. Uh, they were very, a very close group, not only close in age sisters, but they were close friends. And they always celebrated their birthdays together. So I don't know exactly whose idea the brewery tour was, but we did know that uh, the girls, uh, Amy, her husband, her brother-in-law, her sisters, the immediate friends, were going to go on to uh, a brewery tour, and that they had rented a party bus to take them on the tour. And and. You know, what did you think of the idea? I mean, would, was that something that they would normally do, or was it just yeah, because it, it was a yeah, big it didn't birthday? Us. It's something that uh, something they did. They like they like to go out to do different things, but they were also very careful as far as uh, driving. <clears throat> they never uh, they were very careful about drinking and driving, mm -hmm. and so they knew if they all wanted to celebrate, somebody had to drive, and that's why they rented the party bus. But for, unfortunately, the party bus wasn't available. So I guess they substituted the limo. Yeah, that morning, either the night before, either Friday night or Saturday morning, uh, Axel, Amy's husband, and Rich found out that the party bus had canceled on them. So while we were over to high school uh, uh, watching Abby, her daughter Abby, coach her, her daughter's soccer team, they had hired, uh, uh, had hired this limo. Mm -hmm. uh, we we weren't aware of it. We we didn't know the bus uh, the party bus had canceled, so <clears throat> we just assumed they were they were in um, they were still with their original plans. Did you talk to them that day? Yes. In the morning. Yes. yes. What what was you know what was their um, general? We, like I said, we watched Abby uh, coach Arch, Archer soccer game. Uh, Mary and Bob were here with, from Watertown with Isaac at the game. Abby's husband Adam was at the game. Uh, Adam's parents. Tom and I, uh, I think that was it. And after the game, we had come back here, Abby changed her clothes for the party, and the kids all had lunch here. And then they went off, and they must and have they been left, excited. They left, yeah, they were excited. It was a beautiful day. They were going on a brewery trip, celebrating Amy's birthday. And um, I used like I said, they had lunch here, and then they left. They left. Yeah. From what you're saying, they sound like an incredibly close family. You know, I, I think of my own family. I, I have only brothers, and I love my brothers, and we're close, but we don't, we don't go to the, each other's games. We, you know, it's not that kind yeah. of, this sounds like really an extraordinary kind of closeness. Very close. The girls are very, very close. Well, between Tommy and, uh, and Amy, there's only, what, six, seven years? Six years. Yeah, we have... We had five kids in six years. So they all grew up together and they're just really, would you say, inseparable? Very, yes. Yeah. Mary was the only one that didn't live here and it was just because of her work and her, her job in Watertown. Yeah. But she still came, you know, she, she was here I was, at least once a month she was here. Did you hear from them as they were on the trip? Because obviously they were texting people, but I don't know, maybe you don't text or... We do, oh, we do, yeah. and I thought it was odd because about one o'clock, uh, we didn't know exactly what time the limo was leaving. I said they left here at noon, and uh, apparently they were getting on the limo at about one, but we didn't know that. So it was, it was around two, two thirty. Uh, we didn't get any pictures. They were great on sending pictures. You know, we're doing this. This is. Who we're with, where we're going, so on and so forth. But we didn't get any any uh, texts, and I had texted all four of the girls. I didn't receive any messages back. So it was like maybe three o'clock. I said, um, I said to my daughter-in-law, because she, my daughter, my son and daughter-in-law didn't go. I said, Bethany, I says we're not getting any messages. I said, Are you getting anything? And she says, No. She says, But I heard there was an accident. And she says it was a wedding party in a limo that we had an accident. We didn't think anything of it because there right. wasn't a wedding party. So <clears throat> as the day went on, we, we were texting different people, asking different people. Bethany had contacted the state police. They gave us absolutely no information. 
And it was almost six o'clock at night before we found out that there were our kids were in that accident. And the only reason we found out is Kim Steenberg's husband, Rich. Rich, was the contact person with the limo company. And apparently the state police contacted the limo company and gave uh, Rich and Kim's phone number. They contacted Kim and told her what happened. Kim called us and told us there was a tragic accident, the kids are all gone. The thing is that it was on the news. Well, I mean, we were reporting as the day went on that there had been this accident. Were you aware of that or? Yes, we, we were aware, but they kept on saying it was a wedding party. So uh, deep down, I, I was nervous, but if they wouldn't have said it was a wedding party, it would, I would have been worse. Besides which, I'm, I'm guessing that you sit, you know, that stuff just doesn't happen to, you know, to yeah. good people like you, you know? Is, is that, so it's not in your head? No, no. It, was, it, was, it was shocking. It was, it was, we couldn't believe it. I mean, to this day, we still can't believe it. Do you? I, I remember when Father, Father Bob came up about six o'clock. He was a priest, after. yeah, I was yeah. After, yeah. Anyways, uh, I was, and, uh, I told him, I says, you know, this reminds me of a movie I saw when I was growing up. It was a naval story about the Selwyn brothers. The four were killed on the Navy. And that uh, brought on the thing that brothers couldn't be together in a combat zone. So, you know, it's very odd. There was four daughters all in the same accident. And of course, it was such a violent accident that there was no, uh, there was no survivors. Did anyone ever explain to you why you didn't learn till six o'clock? Uh, a lot of it was because the kids didn't have any identification on them. And from what we were told by the state police that because it was such a horrific accident and that um, as they took the bodies out of the limo, they had no identification. They didn't know who was who. And uh, Amy's best friend, Jamie Ott, who happened to be in a wedding that day, which was the reason she didn't go on the trip, she knew everybody who was in the limo. So uh, Jamie came here from the wedding. Uh, the state police captain came here, and he gave, Jamie gave him a list of everybody that w she knew that was in the limo. Uh, uh. But they, I'm pretty sure they didn't, didn't know who was who. And I, you know, <clears throat> so obviously there's got to be this like enormous sense of disbelief that this could have happened. What, and, and to say, what were you thinking and feeling? I mean, it's just such a simple question, was, but what we had no feel. It was like a total shock. I don't remember things for three weeks after that accident. I remember the girl's wake. I remember the funeral. And there's a lot of things that people tell me that happened. I don't remember. Do you think that you forced them out of your mind or you just were going on an autopilot? Uh, definitely autopilot. Yeah. And uh, of course, the uh, constant uh, reporters coming around and uh, come to the door and want to know, want to talk to you. And, <coughs> and of course, we were told not to, not to talk to anybody. Yeah. And uh, I don't know exactly why, but uh, yeah, but, we had we had people calling us up, reporters calling us up at two o'clock in the morning. Oh my God! The sheriff's department ended up putting a, a car down at the end of the street for one or two nights, just to keep people away. We had people going to. I remember this one. Just, uh, a reporter had gone to a friend of ours who has a restaurant in Amsterdam, and ordered some food. She was going to bring it up to us. And it was Jackie Perillo from Perillo's, and. Um, the, this woman had the nerve and the audacity to ask Jackie, if I buy food from you, can you get us in the King House? <gasps> Jackie says, absolutely not. Wow. It was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. For, I don't remember a lot of that stuff. Like our daughter-in-law was, was our son from Long Island and our daughter-in-law was here for a week with us. And um, I carry still, she will tell me things that went on then. I don't remember them. Well, maybe it's a good thing, you know, maybe. Maybe that's the way it should be, not to, to have all that. I mean, I just even 
reliving this. How often do you relive all of this? Mm -hmm. Do you, is, or is it just when people like me come around that you, <laughs> no. well, you know, I mean. Do, well, I mean, we have people that we've known for years that uh, we come across and they talk to us. And uh, I mean, this whole community, I mean, basically, uh, put their arms out to us and, and uh, you know, everybody's been fantastic in that sense. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, something like this, you just don't get over it. It's it's just a bad omen, let's put, put it that way. And uh, we have to live for the other ones. We have three other uh, older children, and we have our grandchildren. So we make a, you know, we make a, a effort to take take care of their needs, and we put the other stuff aside because there's nothing we can do about it. You know. How long before you were ready to do that, though? Huh? Yeah, it was a couple of months. Yeah, a few months. I mean, some people would think that's amazing that after just a couple of months, you were able to, you know, well, we have graduate. some sense of normalcy yeah. in your lives. Well, we well, you know, uh, gradually worked it, it, into Yeah, it. It, took, it, it over time. It's taken time, but we like to remember the happy things. Yeah. Well, Linda's been involved with all the insurance, all the... Uh, what do you call it? Y'all had uh, paperwork. The paperwork. mounds and mounds of paperwork we went through. Because after Y'all had girls... uh, college loans they had to take care of. We had, were fortunate to have the GoFundMe money. It helped us with the with all the uh, the expenses. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Four funerals to pay for. We had three houses to try and sell. We had seven cars. We had over a hundred thousand dollars for the college loans that we had signed for them. Because they were just starting out in their lives, you know, with their jobs. They all still had college loans. They had car loans. They had home they all, loans. They all had college yeah. degrees. They all, yeah. One was a teacher, one was an engineer, one was a nurse. And, and uh, Allison was in uh, work for Hills March. And uh, you were all doing very successful, very successful women, you know. Well, you have much reason to be proud, and I'm sure that you had great hopes and dreams for each one of them. Can you share any of that with us? What you, where you thought they'd be, what you... Um, I think uh, Abby had always, from a young child, she had always wanted to be a teacher. She, she ended up being a teacher, a remedial reading teacher, and from what we've been told from her fellow teachers and some of her students, that she was a very successful teacher. Uh, she had two two little girls. She probably wouldn't have had any more children. I think they were, they were done with that. Uh, they had just bought a new house a couple months before their accident. So I think Abby would have stayed here in Amsterdam. Uh, she, would have, she would have been a very successful teacher, uh, a good mother. She was very involved in what her daughters did. Just recently, they, they honored her with a... Uh in the, what do you call it? Reading, uh, yeah, that over in the high school, there's a courtyard that uh, one of Abby's students, uh, uh, Herd, uh, McHerd. Yeah, I can't think of his first name. His last name is McHerd. Uh, he was a, a student of Abby's. And, and his Eagle Scout project was turning this courtyard into a reading, uh, a reading area for students. And he had just recently dedicated it to Abby. Oh. It was very, it's very beautiful. Wow. So, wow. Well, how about so, the other girls? Uh, Mary was an engineer. She was a, a RLC, ROTC cadet through high school. And, and studying college at Clarkson. And she was a Clarkson graduate. She was in the Army for four years. She got out as a, she was a captain when she got out. She spent a year in Iraq. She was involved with uh, building the first school for a uh, first all-girls school in El, down in El Basra in Iraq. Wow. And she came back, she was in, or came back from Iraq. She didn't, she, she did, her husband wasn't military, so she didn't want to do another overseas stint, so she had gotten out of the service. Uh, 
was working up at Fort Drum, and from working at Fort Drum, she ended up uh, working for an upstate construction company who did a lot of uh, military contracts. She was very successful in her job, too, and she was a part owner of uh, upstate construction at the time of her death. And where did you see her going in her future? Uh, she would come and go. She, from Watertown, she would come through this way because she did a lot of work on the East Coast, Rhode Island. Newport, Newport New Rhode London. Newport, Rhode Island. And she would but drop Isaac off on a Monday. He would stay here with us. He was a baby then. He would stay here with us, and then she'd pick him up on Friday afternoon on her way back home. Uh, so, like, she, even though she lived in She had a bright town, future, though. Yeah, but um, she, but she was uh, a woman, and she was a veteran. So she got priority on a lot of federal contracts. Oh. That's why the, she got in, involved with the, the upstate. And uh, they were, she was an asset to them. Yeah. And, uh, okay. and Rob was an engineer as well, but he worked right in, uh, right in Watertown. So they had really Just this substantial this, income. You know, r really great little family then. Yeah, yeah. They were also into uh, what they call CrossFit. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, they, uh, Mary was a CrossFit coach, and she was, did a lot of CrossFit competitions. Rob was involved in it too. Yeah. So. What about your other two daughters? Oh, what yeah. it, your Allison, hopes and dreams for your other two daughters. Allison uh, lived in uh, Balsam Spa. Uh, she was, she was a little uh, homebody for her animal lover. She and her, her fiance Brian had a. They raised. Chickens, ducks, turkeys, they both had dogs. Uh, gardens, didn't, uh, they had their gardens. She was a gardener too. She took up gardening. <laughs> Father's green thumb. <laughs> so. But she was, uh, she was, very, she was, Allison was a very intelligent girl. She actually had better SAT scores than the rest of her sisters. But she was one of these, she just floated along. She didn't really, uh, she graduated from Plattsburgh State, and uh, and she was happy to get an ordinary job, really. Yeah. And uh, she was comfortable in her life. Good girl. Yeah. Good girl. All and, right. Uh, who are we missing here? Amy, the youngest Amy. one. Amy. Yeah. Amy yeah. was the, the birthday girl. <laughs> she had only been married for what three months, four months. They got married again in end of June. End of June, her and Axel got married. And of course that must have been a really happy, you know, really special family event, huh? Yeah. It's a baby gets married. Yeah. She was the baby of the family, but she was a go-getter. She was a big, big soccer player. Like her well, friend all, Jamie Ash. All the girls were athletic. They all participated. In, but uh, Amy was in the travel soccer with uh, Capital United. And uh, she went to college at Plattsburgh. She played for the Plattsburgh State Plattsburgh College. State College or... And uh, she was very active in that. She got a degree at Plattsburgh, and she ended up not really satisfied with that. She, so she wanted to get into nursing. And she got her RN degree, and she worked for the state. Which she was had... also working for the Justice Department for the state. That was her full-time job. Yeah. Uh, she got her nursing her RN degree, and she worked in, in the nursing, the local nursing home in our River Ridge. On weekends. Uh, nights and weekends. So geriatric nursing was her big calling. Yeah. I sit here and I listen to you talk with so much pride about your girls and and how much they'd accomplished in their young lives. And you think you think it anyway, but this this just is just a horrific. You know, loss right. to not to you as their parents, but to the whole community that they lived in. I mean, just a huge loss. Yeah. It was. Just I mean, they had so much potential, and of course, the two younger ones, Allison and Amy, were just starting out in married life. And uh, well, Allison hadn't been married yet, but she would have. They probably would have had a couple more grandchildren. I'm sure we would have had enough. At least. I think we probably would have had maybe five more grandchildren. <laughs> uh, Mary and Rob were planning on having another baby uh, when Isaac went to school. That was in their, their game plan. Amy and Axel were planning on traveling for a couple of years, and then they were going to have their children, two children. And I'm sure Allison 
She would have kept up with her sisters and had two, too. <laughs> were they competitive like that? Oh, Very. yeah. They were competitive. Very competitive. They were, you know, they were athletes. They were all basically good athletes. They were athletes. big softball and soccer players. In fact, at one time, three, three of the four were on the, the high school varsity soccer team. Oh, at the same time? <laughs> at the same time. Oh, wow. That is impressive. Wow. Um, just to, I hate to take you back because this, I, I love hearing about your, your girls. And, but can you tell me how you found out that this accident happened? Was it from the priest, Father Bob? No, it was no, from, it was it was from Axel's. Uh, Rich's wife, Kim, called us and told us that the, the state police had contacted her. And, and then I think we got a, she got a phone number. We called the state police, I think. And uh, we basically said, well, uh, what's the situation? And uh, I think they informed her there was no survivors. But there were, there were two, two of the girls that were in the limo were alive when they were taken out. Our daughter Abby was one, and she died in the Cooperstown Hospital as a Jane Doe because she had no identification, so they couldn't have. But what had happened, I think a lot of the girls had had their IDs in their husband's pockets. That's what, that's what my thinking is. So there, and then, yeah. there was a problem then just identifying them. And of course, we never <laughs> got the cell phones back. Uh, they were crushed. The cell, physical cell phones themselves were crushed. I've been after uh, the state police to get them. We almost got them back once, and then they were uh, said they had to use them for evidence. The, the pictures and the texts and so on, what was on the cell phones has been extracted onto disks. Eventually, we will get them back, because I would like the pictures that the girls took. Oh, yeah. Uh, from, from that day and from whenever. From whatever, yeah. from way back is well, whatever they had on there must have been some them. kind of conversations going on during the case. Allison did get a hold of Brian when he were There were the, a couple of texts, not to us, but there were a couple of texts. Allison had texted Brian and made the remark to him that uh, she could smell the brakes burning when they were going down the hill in Schoharie. Uh, some, I think there were some other texts, but I'm not, not positive on that. See, Brian was, he was over in Galway, well, what do you call? Brian didn't go West, on the trip because he didn't Galloway. drink. West Galway, he didn't go. Yeah. Oh, gee. Fortunately, he didn't go. But he's still, we're still close to Brian. Yeah. yeah. Has that, is it, you know, I asked you, and, and I guess this would tie in too, is it hard to, to talk about this or hard to connect with those who are still around that are no, reminders? No, no I, I really, no, we're, we're close. actually, we enjoy uh, reminiscing about you know, all their activities and accomplishments. Uh, there are everyday conversations. They're, they're, you know, what they like to do and what they didn't like, what they ate and what they didn't eat and what they didn't like, you know, yeah, yeah. all those things. Uh, we are still closer to uh, Abby's teacher friends, to uh, to Brian, um, to Amy's best friend Jamie. In fact, I take care of her little girl for her sometimes. Mm. So. And you've got grandchildren. Now right. they're not staying with you, but um, there are grandchildren who don't have parents now, yeah. but you see them. Yep. We do, yes. We see them often. Yes. And of course, Tommy, who's the oldest of the five children between me and Linda, and uh, of course we had she had two children before when, when I met her, uh, and uh, Chris and uh, Jennifer. Jennifer lives in our old house up in Chazy Lake, oh. which was my grandmother's house, and uh, Chris lives in Long Island. With his family, yeah. And his family. He has two sons, and uh, Liam's 22, oh. and Raymond's a senior in high school. Now, Tommy, who was the brother of the four girls, he has two children, him and Bethany have, and Jacob's 11, and uh, Caroline is about five, five going five. on six. Well, it it and, makes uh, me think that, you know, as you've still got this family that comes together, yeah. what, how do you feel the loss then? How, you know, just, you know, with, with 
your girls, your four girls, not there? Um, we do feel it, but actually it's, I don't know, it's more like a, things have, have. I think it's reminiscing and uh, uh, we talked about it. Uh, our older children, they talked about it. Uh, we, you know, we all miss them and, and uh, we reminisce about different things that each one of them did or liked or some conversation they had, you know, with them. I, I mean, it's... Some fun thing they would have right. been... It's really uh, joyful to, doing to, now, yeah. to be able to, you know, talk about it. I think as the years have gone on, we've more or less moved into a, a different... Uh, in a different stage of our lives. You know, our grandchildren are older, uh, more involved, I think, in what, what they do. I, know, I think it's just been, life progresses and moves on. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, you know, it has to, but at the same time, you want to keep those memories alive. Oh, we do. We do. Oh, yeah. Can you both put in words how that day has changed your lives? Uh, I think it's made us realize uh, life is for the living. Uh, I know when Amy, when Amy got married, she had the sign, and our, our priest had brought it up at her funeral too. Uh, the, sign, the little sign had said, uh, live in the moment. It had a picture of a little camera on the bottom with a little slash through it. She wanted people to live in the moment of her wedding. She didn't want them standing around taking pictures and looking at them later. So. I think that's that's my interpretation. You know, live in the moment. Life is for the living. And how do you do that now? We move on with our children and our grandchildren. We also uh, reminisce a lot about the girls. I mean, we, we had a lot of fun, fun memories of the 30 years that they were with us. 30 plus years. Anything to add, Tom? How it's changed your life? Uh, I don't know if it's changed my life. It's uh, it's uh, you appreciate things more, I think, and you appreciate your grandchildren and your children more, the ones that are still with you, and uh, you keep that in mind. You know, uh, you enjoy having them around for the holidays, and even without the holidays, like today is Thursday. Tommy and his family will come up and have uh, dinner with us hmm. and the kids will run around and grandpa will holler at them <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyways it's it's you know exercise that we enjoy and uh, like I say Linda's kept herself going with us all this paperwork and the trials and all that I never went to the trials I had no interest to go in there why is that? I don't know. I just just didn't want to go there. Did you did you fear hearing the details? No, not so much that. It's just that I didn't. I really didn't want to be connected to this guy, and and just have to look at him every day. Bad enough to have to watch him on TV, and. Uh, I, I really. I, I went. I wanted to be part of the of the girls ju getting justice for the girls. Well, that I wanted justice, but I felt that I wasn't going to add anything by going there, and uh, you know. It was tough, especially that first round, where uh, <clears throat> before Judge Lynch came in, and uh, before when Hassan got off on his uh, community service. Yeah, that, that was a tough pill to swallow. Because it came out of left field. You, did you right. know it was coming? No. Well, we, everybody was shocked. I think the best thing that ever happened was uh, the Judge Lynch. He came up, he came about and said, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, this we is, all agree. This, just... this is crazy, you know. Uh, you take what you're going to get. If you don't want to take it, you're going to go on trial. That's all there is to it. And I think that was... A pivotal movement toward justice, and I think that uh, it definitely was. I can remember sitting in the courtroom cheering. 
It was it was a happy day. In fact, it was on your birthday. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a happy and, day. And I, I was just going to say, we heard that, cheer, you know, the, the audio picked up that cheer from the from everyone in that courtroom. I mean, it, what was that moment like? It was unbelievable. We was, we we thought we thought he was done. He was going to get off on his community service, stocking shelves in a food bank. I mean, that was really tough. And um, if we were just ecstatic. It came out of nowhere. It was like, wow, can you believe that? How did they explain to you that that was what was going to happen? I mean, how did they make that make sense? It, actually, they didn't explain it to it. Judge Lynch was was going through his papers, was reading different things about it. And all of a sudden, at the end, he says, bang, he says, you got 15 minutes. He says, you going to want to go to trial, or are you going to accept uh, a whatever year and a half, uh, whatever it was? Yeah. Hey, Ski, what's up, hon? I, <laughs> I was thinking more about how they explained to you that he was not going to go to prison. How did they explain how that? How they explain? Uh, uh, I mean, how did they make that make sense? It was the, the it was the DA, it was a agreement between the original judge, the DA, and uh, Hussan's lawyers. Kinlan. Yeah. So, Lindy, you were. You were there in the courtroom just about every day. Did you find yourself looking at Naman Hussein? Did you, did you, what were you I doing in there? I sat behind him a few times. And I thought to myself, I says, either this guy is so fucking stupid, or, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. So, Let's try that so, one again. He's either so stupid or he knows what he's doing. He just wants to sit there and act like he didn't know, like, like he didn't he know what victim. he did. He's a victim, like he was a victim. Like a victim, yeah. But um, in the second trial uh, with the special prosecutor, he was very, very exact on the call, on the, uh, on the emails and the phone calls that the DOT, uh, the, the ex yeah, but the, that lawyer from Saratoga, he was very yeah. thorough. He was the second best thing that ever happened. The first was Lynch, and remember, then there was that. What, I can't remember what Because he, he got right the down to the, the nitty-gritty. He wasn't a DA. He, he was a regular lawyer. Okay. I think he was a uh, He was defense. worked for Department of Transportation. He was retired. Yeah. But he was, a, uh, he was an examiner, a DOT examiner. And he was the one that was working with Hussan to get the limo uh, Roadworthy to have it inspected, and the press, press, are you special about? prosecutor Wrench. Yeah, got every Wrench, phone that was call, his name. every email, everything he was <coughs> ninety minutes he went through at that trial, proving how many times he tried to get Hussan to get that limo inspected. Hmm. And what it came came down to was the limo was so big, they couldn't get it on a lift at Mavis. Um, when you left the courtroom on every day that you were there, what, what were you thinking and feeling? Um, we, at, as uh, Judge Lund took over, we were very hopeful. We were thinking maybe maybe we're going to see justice this time. But then the first in the first first trial. time was terrible. It was like we basic they basically told us uh, it's going to be an agreement that, uh, through. Uh, the original Judge Bartlett, uh, Hassan's lawyer, and uh, the district attorney, Mallory, that this is what it's going to be. But, I mean, as, as you watched it, it like play year, out, it must, it's got to have been like, look at, I've lost so much. We were, yeah, we were so disappointed. We were all so disappointed. And then it was, it was almost a year. In fact, it was exactly a year. When Judge Lynch took over after Judge Bartlett retired, Judge Lynch took over, and uh, said, "This is it. We're going to have it. You either accept the the jail term, or he gave me he gave him 15 minutes in the courtroom. You either accept the jail term, or we go to trial." And that was the day we were all cheering. We were all happy. So we said, "Maybe we're going to see justice." You and it, it just got better and better from there. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, um, what do you think of Nalan Hussein? I don't think much of him at all. I think he was lazy. 
he was conniving, and he was probably bribing, bribing the, uh, the Mavis uh, manager. Because I, th I got to thinking, why, why would this manager put his job on the line to pass this limo? I mean, the, what, what was his reason? I think was the reason he being was pretty It pretty never came simple. out that he accepted a bribe, but yeah. I mean, but, you, just don't, you just don't do stuff like that. Well, it's pretty simple. It's, it's a thing that's infectious in the society is greed. And some people will go through steps and steps and steps to avoid what they should do just for the sake of greed. And that's and, what you feel happened here. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's what was his. He, was gonna, he wasn't going to lose that sale, so he sent that limo knowing it wasn't worthy, but not really caring, figured nothing was going to happen, lackadaisically, and uh, huge poor judgment. And like I say, uh, I think it was looking, more than poor judgment. I think this guy was lazy. Well, that, that's part of being lazy. And he needs to be in jail too, that. Uh, Mr. Parks, the manager from Mavis, he ought to be in the cell next to Hussan. Did you, my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> do you? Um, so, but honestly, as I'm listening to you, I'm not saying you're giving him a pass, but you're being pretty easy on a man who led, whose actions led to the deaths of 20 people. I mean, do you see? Obviously, you you must see character flaws, and you know that this. This is more than just laziness that was involved. Yeah, I thought to myself, I could, at first I thought, maybe, maybe this guy isn't educated, doesn't know what's going on. But then I realized, I mean, he's a high school graduate. He was running a business. He had an order. I think he was just, he was lazy and he was cheap. He was too damn cheap to spend $2,000 getting these brakes fixed, which would have saved 20 lives. Or, or the other thing is not putting that thing on the road anymore. It should have been put in the salvage yard. So that you know? was his income. Well, I mean, his father took off back. Wasn't to the, the only vehicle. I don't think that was the only vehicle they had in that. But I uh, don't know. I think they, I think it was. I think it was the only one they used, and that was their income. That was probably their only source of income, because from what I read in the papers, the hotel was a disaster too. So uh, during the um, victim impact statements, your daughter-in-law Bethany spoke about your amazing, really tremendous strength through all of this and how it's really, you know, kept the family going and, and kept you going at the same time. Where did that strength come from? Did you know you had it? Probably uh, not. I think we just, I don't know if we were on automatic pilot and just moved on or. Well, a lot of that Actually, had to our, our family, I don't know, I would say our family kept us going. Our grandkids and our kids kept us going. Well, the other thing is our, our faith. Our faith, too, yes. I mean, our faith in, in, in God and... and uh, we have a wonderful priest, Father Bob, from St. Stan's. He's but, a wonderful uh, man. And then, of course, we've had a tremendous, tremendous... Uh, out people coming to us and, and generosities in form of, you know... Families and friends. Make, all our good friends came forward and embraced us, you know, and I think that helped to, to you know. Uh, just to pick up on the faith, because I, I told you that Paul Tonko had said to me. Um, He's a very we're fr faithful We're friends. Guy. Yes, he is. He certainly is. But he had said to me that he knew you from, uh, I don't know, just from church, but certainly from that. and that he, he is really struck by your amazing faith. So is, is it sort of the belief in a hereafter that, that makes that, you know, that somehow you'll see your girls again or, you know, that kind of faith or just? Oh, definitely. I'm sure we will see them. I'm sure we will all be together again someday. Uh-huh. You talk about your faith. I assume you believe in a hereafter that you'll yes, see your girls again. I definitely again. do. I definitely know. I know we will be together with the girls. I'm not sure what form it'll be, but I guess it's something. And uh, does that give you great comfort? Yes. Yeah. It's it's a hopeful 
thing, you know, you, you hope that things will come about that way, but, you know. Yeah. So here we are, here we are five years later. Where are you both emotionally and spiritually now? I think we're st spiritually we're the same as we were before. You know, we have a uh, we have a great priest. We have a great parish. Uh, I think that you know we're not. We'll never be over the situation, but you know the whole dilemma of it. But we've been stronger as a family, I think, because uh, we realize the severity of what happened that it could happen again, and we pray to God that it won't happen again, and that we'll live out our lives, you know. Uh, I think, too, we have a different outlook on life now. We're more uh, more laid back, more understanding, and uh, our own family and other people, too. Like, you know, like, for instance, you know, if I see, if I see somebody beeping in, passing me or something, I just, like, you know, calm down. This is life. You know, mm. relax. <laughs> yeah, it's not and, important. Yeah, it's. I think we're more more laid back, more understanding of everything. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> I want to definitely talk about the community support because it's been really amazing, and I I want to hear from your perspective, and and maybe and and some particular moments so <coughs> that we can maybe just match up the video to to what we're talking about but I think of that vigil what were you at the vigil the original vigil the, the one on night? the bridge no, we weren't we weren't oh okay so uh, was there was there a vigil that you did go to yes okay well, we went to a numerous amount you went to a lot we went to, uh, a couple of days later we went hmm. well actually our daughters our, our two daughter-in-laws went to the original the first video the first vigil uh, we didn't go. Uh, we went to the first year anniversary run. Uh, we have been, I have been down to the Apple Barrel a few times. Uh, Josh and his family have been wonderful. The memorial is beautiful. I just, I guess you could say we had, it's, the community has been outstanding. Uh, the high school where uh, the, the, not the high school, the middle school where Abby taught has been very supportive. Well, are you surprised at that? No. Um, yes and no. Abby was very, she was very popular and I'm, I'm sure Abby would have been doing the same thing had she survived, had, had the roads been reversed. Uh, she would have been doing this for somebody else. Yes, definitely. And, and when we talk about the, the community, obviously, you can see from your emotion that you're very grateful for that kind of support. But you're probably living these quiet lives here in this house on this great little street with your chickens and your, your garden and never ever in a million years dreamed that you would become the center of this horrible event and, and, and that you, you had to learn how to, to cope and deal, not just with the tragedy, but with everything that went with it. Do you right. ever think about that? Our, neighbor, our neighbors are, are the same. They're very supportive of us, supportive of us. Uh, but did you ever, I mean, you can't, I guess you think, don't know what strength you have uh, until you're, it's called for. You don't, yeah, you don't know, yeah, you don't know your inner strength until you, you need to call on it. Yes. And here you are, just again, this great family living quiet, you know, successful, happy lives that all of a sudden everything is turned upside down. Did you think you would be able to deal with it? No, no. I think we, in the beginning, no. But as time went on, I think we did. We, we learned to accept that was our fate and um, we were going to make the best of it. Tom? Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything that, uh, I think you become better, uh, better human being after dealing with something like this. Uh, you know, I mean, you have more sympathy for others. You have more uh, gratitude for, you know, 
society and, and the people around you because, you know, they all came uh, forward for us and uh, we appreciated everything they've done. But uh, I think you've become better for it, yeah. honestly. Did you watch the vigil on TV, the one, the big one that they had at the, on the bridge there? I'm just wondering, you did not go because it was just too raw? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even know if I watched it or not. But you, and even if you just saw clips afterwards. I think I did. I think I saw, uh, as time went on, I think I saw clips of it. Maybe at the first anniversary, I did see it. Okay. Uh, just I know the I scope of there. it and the beauty of it yeah. was really just. It was beautiful. It was. Yeah. And the memorial, you talked about that a little bit. <clears throat> did you, you, I mean, you didn't probably see that coming, but it was, it, what a, what a lovely gesture. And do you, do you find solace there? Yes. Well, tell, can you talk to that a little bit? I mean, what, um, we, we, we go down, we've been down a few times. I've been more down more than the time. And, and we did stop a lot after it was on the way back home from, uh, from court. So we did stop a few times. Uh, we ate there with Josh and his family. Yeah. And we, we, we walked over to the memorial. I mean, it's just a beautiful place. Yeah. Was it hard to be, because, because of the way you had to travel, to be going by there to the courtroom? Was it, um, no. I mean, knowing what had happened. Uh, Actually, actually, I, I would kind of like, you know, hi girls. The same as when we go past the cemetery where they're in the wild that they're entombed in. You talk to them. Mm -hmm. You talk to them. Yes. That's nice. Yeah, that's really nice. Can you talk for a, a second about the, just some of the community events, like the, the GoFundMe, the, you know, the, the vigils, oh, the, the, the uh, yeah, you know, the, I'm sure the calls that you've gotten, the, the letters, I mean, just. It, oh, what, I have the letters. I can tell you, I have stacks and stacks of cards. I saved every single card. And we must have got, if we, we got one, we must have got 200. Wow. We got gifts from people we don't even know, from different churches. Uh, we, we still get prayer cards every year, every anniversary. Um, from different organizations. GoFundMe, GoFundMe was a godsend. It helped with the, the expenses. I mean, we didn't have $300,000 sitting in the bank to pay off what we had to pay off for the girls. Wow, wow. And the community support is, is still strong, like the, the, what they're doing over at the high school for Abby. Because again, I keep getting back to the idea that you live these quiet lives just, you know, kind of privately, and then all of a sudden you become sort of, the, you know, in the public eye for a terrible reason, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and yet people come through for you, you know, I mean, yeah. that you don't even, you'll never know. We try to stay out of the public eye, and we definitely keep the kids out, as yeah. so we want them to live as private lives as possible. Um, another thing the community has done that I didn't mention to you is uh, the River Ridge Nursing Home where Amy worked dedicated their sunroom to her. Oh. And Paul Stanko's mother was still alive and she was a resident down there then. Oh, really? So, yeah. Ah. Oh. So he was down there. He, I was going to say, he <laughs> went to visit her a lot. <laughs> yeah. He was visiting her the day they dedicated it. And so and he was in it. Uh, and pa Paul's been very supportive of us too. Uh, even when we were involved with uh, uh, the where we talked about the victims. Oh, the Grieving Families Act? The Grieving Act? Families Act, yes. Uh, Paul came and he showed his support too for us. So what about like the, you know, the, it really was astonishing to look at the video because I did not go to the funeral, but to look at the video and see the, the, the way people reacted or supported you. I had people that I hadn't seen for 20 years from up north, or from all over. There, were, I, I spent like a, it was almost six and a half hours. I stood there and kept welcoming people that came through. Uh, it was, it was at a six-hour wait. 
Yeah. Six hour wake. It started at three o'clock and it was nine o'clock by the time it was over. And I met so it many amazing. people. The people. And after the end of that whole thing, I was, I don't know, I was astonished. I was astonished at how many people that uh, touched our lives that were willing to come out and just, you know, give us their, uh, their thoughts and their people giving me money and stuff. It was ridiculous. It was crazy. For we six... have a whole crew of Hill and Marks come to the wake. Everybody. Wow. Wow. I mean, and then the had... owners came up to visit us one day, too. Very nice people. Wow. And, you know, I'm assuming that it restores, if, you, if there was any loss of faith in humanity, I mean, you got to, what was it like that day then for you? I mean, six hours is a really long time. You must have been exhausted. But were you also somehow f fulfilled or filled with that goodness? We were, we were astonished at how many people knew our children and, and, and came to pay their respects. It's and I'm assuming a lot of people you didn't know as well. Well, well there was... the, the wake was for four different families. It was it was our family. It was the ja Jackson Muldoon family. It was the Dyson family. It was the Steinberg family. So we were all like in a line in the beginning of the church. But because our kids were so close to everybody else, and we a lot of people knew everybody there. I mean, that's that to me also is the real tragedy here. That this was. You know, these were kids that that just loved each other. You know, yeah. they they wanted to be together. They they did things together. They did, the they did so much together. Like for an example, uh, uh, <clears throat> Pat Cushing was Archer's gra uh, godfather. So not only were they close friends, they were in each other's weddings. They were godparents to each other's children. Yeah, just you know, really kind of they inseparable. Were, they weren't. They were a very, very close group of friends. Mm -hmm. um, and now, as we've gone through this, most of us parents are, I mean, most of us knew each other before, but we are now closer. What kind of comfort did you get from each other? Nobody the would know the, the idea of the loss that you suffered except somebody else who had lost somebody in that accident. It was comforting. We, we could talk to each other. Like a, a few of the parents are divorced and a few single mothers, uh, they could talk to us. That they, we had somebody to, to just generally confide in, put it that way. And you know, when we went to court uh, during the trials, we were, uh, we were close. We would I mean, have lunch afterwards together, talk about things. And you would all sit together? Yes, we, we did. We, we went to uh, the Apple Barrel a few times. I would say three or four times we went to the Apple Barrel after court hearings. We sat together in court. It was, Schoharie Court is kind of small, so. Yeah. You know, you don't really have much, uh, um, many seats, but we all sat together. We are all friends. You stay in touch with them? Stay in touch, yes. Okay. Um, almost, I promise. Let me just check and see if there was anything else that they want. Oh, we we talked about the Grieving Families Act. Mm -hmm. What what was your? I know you were helping to push for it, but what was your hope there? We were uh, we were hoping for some financial security for the three grandchildren, actually the four grandchildren, the four grandchildren that were the four orphan children, mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of times Kim Kim's daughter Aubrey gets left out because. I thought Aubrey lost her father, she still has her mother, but <clears throat> Rich was the, the main uh, uh, like caretaker family, breadwinner kind of thing. Yes, main breadwinner of their family. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these, these kids have no parents. So there's a, they're going to need money for college, they're going to need money for weddings, uh, their first car, things that Education. their parents normally provide for their children. And New York State doesn't really have a system to New York State correctly is one of, compensate. Is one of two states does not do this. As much money, it is much, uh, uh, how do you say, as much, as much as New York State does, it does nothing for the, in this situation. And, and the That's governor didn't we sign hoping, it. We were hoping Governor Hochul would have passed this, but she just let it die on her desk. 
But you say there's a chance it'll come back. There's a chance it's coming back, but it's not going to help our grandchildren. Um, since we brought up the, the subject, what is the status of the settlements? Now, it seems as if one of your daughters has uh, two of one ours, of the estates. Uh, three of our four daughters' estates are settled, yes. And why did you want to settle rather than having some kind of a court day in we court? Were, no money is ever going to bring our children back. No amount of money. I don't think Mavis wanted to go on trial, to be honest with you. Absolutely. It would be a huge blemish because they had not a leg to stand on. So, I mean, I think they were more than willing to sit down and, and look at reality. And uh, fortunately, it took us five years, unfortunately, I'd say. For our two daughters that didn't have any children, we accepted their first offer. We weren't going to fight with them. For the, the other two daughters that have children, uh, one, one, is, one is satisfactorily settled, and the other one has not been settled yet. Hmm. Hopefully these girls, hopefully these kids will have enough money someday for, for college, for weddings, for cars, things that uh, their parents would have provided for them. Do you talk to your grandchildren about their parents? Yes. Well, we talk to them in relationship to the, you know, in the past, you know. We don't talk about the tragedy. We talk about... We talk about the happy things in their lives. Yeah. Like, a, you know, we'll say, well, like in particular, Archer's a joker, just like her father. I said, you joke, joke around. She's always trying to pull somebody's leg. She's, she's like that. Elle is uh, very uh, astute. She, she's like Abby. It's and, like her uh, mom loves, the, loves vegetables. That's what I'll tell her. Archer, or Elle will go around the garden and she'll pick things up and eat them. I said, she's just like your mama. She loves vegetables too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And Isaac, Isaac is a spitting image of his father with the athleticism of both his parents. Hmm. So they're they're uh, well they don't ask they yeah. don't ask them about what yeah. happened to them. Were they too young to know no, to Isaac, understand that they're Isaac they and Archer uh, know what happened. El El was only sixteen months old, so she didn't she doesn't know. She knows who her parents are from pictures and stories, but Archer and Isaac remember their parents. Yeah, and but they don't ask about it. Or you keep them away from that topic. We try to keep their lives private. We don't want them in the we don't let them watch the news stories. We don't let them watch the news stories. <laughs> but I did, what I did do is uh, I saved all the news, newspaper. We get two newspapers. We get the cassette and we get the recorder. And I saved all the articles from the day of the accident up to the present time. And I've cut those articles out and put them in a book for the kids because I think maybe someday they would like to read them. Just to know. Yeah. Just to know. Yes, I don't know. If it was me, I would probably be curious. They probably I, would too, right? Yes, yeah. sure, sure. I mean, it's their parents. So I thought it would be something, you know. I, I gave Isaac's grandmother his his book, and I, I'm still working on one for Archer and Elle. Five years later, what are you thinking and feeling about all that you've lost, all that you've been through, all that your family has endured here? Um, well, for one thing, I'm glad Hussan is in jail. I'm glad the trial is over. Although he still has an appeal in the works, I don't think he's going to get very far with that. Hopefully not. Uh, I'm glad uh, I'm glad our grandchildren are doing well. I'm glad we're still alive to help them. Well, that's the big thing. I'm glad the kids are well-adjusted, uh, regardless of their loss, especially for Isaac, Ellen, Archer. Uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, they're well taken care of. And I think that, uh, I think they'll move on much better than we have probably because they don't know a lot about it. You know, they'll just know the Pacifics that they find in a newspaper clippings or whatever. You're not going to have to feel the harsh 
you know, reality of the deaths and everything. You know, we're all different people, and I'll tell you, just personally, when my parents died, I, I mean, that was just normal age-related deaths. There was nothing, you know, horrible other than that I've lost something that I love very dearly. I've cried every day, you know. I mean, that's just who I am. That's how I am. Yeah. But, but it's, but um, it just seems that your strength is that, or, or maybe you do that. I don't know, but that you're so strong that, you know, that you that you're moving forward rather than looking back. Where are you on that? You know, that kind of continuum. We're definitely moving forward. I think there's there's no sense of looking back. What was, you know, what was is. The future, uh, the future is our grandchildren and our children. I, I look at their achievements and proud of what they've accomplished over their short lives. Uh, so I concentrate on that much more than, you know, I think Linda gets much more emotional because it's hurtful. I mean, it's hurtful for me, but I also look at the fact that you know, I have to, I have to appreciate they were here and what they did was uh, outstanding. And uh, I'm very proud of them for that. Yeah, somebody once asked me, if, if you knew that you were going to lose your children, would you have had children? And I said, yes, because we had 30 good years with those girls. And they were good girls. Yep. Yeah. You you mentioned the appeal a little bit. I mean, does that kind of like the um, fact that he's that there's an appeal here? Does that kind of just really grate on you? That, that no, it doesn't grate on me. But um, in fact, I I have congratulated the, the panel of special prosecutor and the DA after uh, after was sentenced in. Uh, I remember D.A. Mallory saying to me, she says, well, she goes, it's not over yet. She goes, he still has a chance of an appeal. And I thought to myself, I, I didn't understand what the, you know, what the appeal was, but I really don't think he's going to be successful in his appeal. I think he's going to hopefully spend five years in prison. Is that enough realizing. from your it's point of view? It's not enough, but uh, nothing would be enough. 200 years would not be enough. Well, the thing is, he's been that's exposed. That's the law in New York State. He, they, he got the maximum of what they could sentence him for. Yeah. The, the main thing is he's been exposed for what he did and what, what happened. And uh, that's not going to change. That's not going to change. And one other thing that I remember you saying when the original verdict was reached, or the, the, uh, the, uh, the plea deal was reached, you called it a cop-out. I mean, I'm sure you were very angry, and but talk about why a cop out or what you were feeling. We all were. We couldn't believe it. Here's a guy that was guilty of 20 lives, 20 deaths, and he got community service. I didn't. I couldn't. None of us could believe that that's what he got. None of us could believe that the DA agreed to that. No, he never did get all the details on it. So, but I think she felt that she didn't have enough evidence to go to trial. Was there anything else about the actual day? You told me how you found out. Um, what were those next days like? Right after that? What? Right after that, we were I very disappointed. Oh. Was, was, well. I mean, after the accident. Yeah, I was so. thinking actually oh, about the, the accident. accident. I know you said you couldn't yeah. remember it, a lot of it. It was but. a deep hurt, or just a deep hurt that you just seemed like you couldn't get it out of yourself. You know, you just couldn't get it out. You know, it, you couldn't believe it happened. And uh, it took a while for that to get out of your system, you know, out of your brain. That, uh, you know. Yeah, like you know it happened, happened, but it you happened, can't accept it. You know. Uh, there was nothing you could do. It was helpless. You know, you just... And uh, gradually, you know, you realize what it was, and there was nothing you could do to change it. And all these people coming at you oh, because... 
you know, your whole life was. It was comforting. Down. All the people that came, it was it was comforting to talk to people. Really, and we had an endless stream <laughs> of people. It, do, it food, still doesn't so stop. Much, it st so much. hasn't stopped from the day it happened. You know, uh, there's people that never, never, you know, to keep. You hadn't been in the area or something, you know. They come back and friends you had years ago, uh, yeah. but the everyday people. Yeah, yeah.